Thank you very much. We have a very dense schedule, so uh, I will not add anything more than my personal thanks to the Chuminashvili Institute, to ECA, to Zizi, to everybody who helped us so much during our trip to Spanetti, which we will never forget. Not only on scientific grounds it was very successful, but also on emotional and personal grounds. So, um, I would like to give the floor to um, uh, Nina, Nina Cicinazze, a very good friend of mine, and most pleased to introduce her, and uh, uh, the topic of her speech will be items of vanity, art, and devotion. I would remind, I would like to remind all speakers that if you have 30 minutes at your disposal, please don't oblige me to stop you at some moment. Yeah, please stop me. <laughs> do, do stop me. <laughs> Usually I respect time, but who knows. <laughs> okay. There is no microphone? Eka, no? Do you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's really very exciting day today to meet after these um, turbulent times, I mean the COVID situation, lockdowns, to see old friends and um, I guess new friends as well and colleagues. I'm really, it's an emotional day for me. And so it is a great honor and um, pleasure for me to be part of this conference. It is a real privilege to have an opportunity to present my paper today. Our meeting aiming to discuss interactions of objects, images, and bodies with built and natural spaces of medieval Svaneti is a multi-layered topic uh, requiring analysis um, of huge material uh, which vary of various nature. Uh, this is rather challenging enterprise. However, I would like to draw your attention on interactions of painted images of various types in a sacred space. I slightly changed the focus of my um, presentation and uh, I decided to discuss on, so offer you a case study. Uh, oops. Okay. And to discuss, um, most of you know very well this um, absolutely fantastic painting, uh, St. Barbara Church uh, in He. Okay, let me make it wider, uh, enlarge. Okay. Oh, what I did? Something wrong? No? Okay. Visual arts of medieval Georgia offer insights into the complex and multivalent process of formation of cultural landscape, which varied from region to region in stylistic, conceptual, and technical terms. The cultural developments closely linked with the social, political, and religious situation in the Kingdom of Georgia resulted in establishing of characteristic visual languages of various types, um, not from, um, uh, as well as uh, repertoire. So style, iconography, and subject varies from area to uh, region, at least uh, from uh, today's from present um, point of view. Uh, this is the picture. Diverse styles, iconography, uh, structural and symbolic system of medieval Georgian visual arts were nourished by various traditions, both local and foreign. In recent decades, scholars are challenging to um, elaborate appropriate methodological and uh, theoretical framework for uh, better perception of medieval Georgian visual arts in order to avoid its Byzantinocentric, let's say, or colonial interpretations. Scholars, and I would really uh, appreciate what you do. I mean, um, Michele, Ivan, uh, Anthony, uh, Manuela, Thomas. So the list will be um, quite long. The scholars, uh, okay, approach from various perspectives to the objects of their uh, inquiry, considering cultural exchange, cultural uh, transfer, uh, trying to find the proper uh, terms and proper approaches, adaptation, adaptation of images and concepts, taking into consideration the great variety of pictorial languages of medieval Georgian religious images. It is not possible to interpret them from one perspective. Uh, applying only art historical methods, descriptive, formal, stylistic, iconographic, etc. The picture of medieval Georgian visual arts is far from being homogenic and represents a whole range of 
you know, striking paradigms which often are quite difficult to interpret appropriately since there is dramatic lack of uh, written sources. I do not intend to give final answers, uh, rather maybe I will complicate situation a little bit and probably I will add one more challenging layer in this bulk of problems. I think I won't be wrong if I say that among different types of works of church art, icons are most uh, actively engaged in various types of interactions. They establish multiple links and networks within and beyond sacred spaces. Icons, which have a multiple functional and symbolic meanings, um, connect material and immaterial, uh, or spiritual, temporal and eternal, physical and metaphysical. Thanks to the dogmatic and symbolic meaning, icons are introduced in broad spectrum of practices covering diverse cultural, social, and um, let's say spiritual or mystical or mystagogical levels. Uh, they demonstrate whole range of beliefs and uh, attitudes towards sacred, historical past and upcoming future and present, of course. In other words, they cross spatial and time boundaries and function in multiple directions. Icons at um, the same time are most um, democratic, let's say, cheap medium, so a demanded type of Christian images, combining diverse practices and means of expression. I mean, uh, style, expression uh, in technical terms, uh, style, um, iconography, embellishment, and so on. Icons from Svaneti, one of the most impressive repositories of medieval Georgian artistic heritage of Georgia, and you had a possibility to, okay, to see that. Uh, okay, uh, the artistic heritage of Georgia could not be considered in relation to their present location, since in majority of cases they are not produced in local workshops and were moved many times from place to place throughout centuries. Their majority have been uh, donated or transferred from other parts of Georgia in different periods and for different reasons. Several hundreds of icons housed in the Museum of Swaneti and numerous local churches and private collections have been studied in recent decades, but there is still much to be done for their uh, perception and appreciation. Medieval painting of Swaneti have been introduced, and I think um, uh, most of you know the history of study of Georgian monumental painting, but I owe I, it's my duty to mention again my older colleagues who laid the foundation for the study of the phenomenon known as the Swaneti School of Painting. Shalvaminanashvili, Tina Tindisaladze, my um, dearest um, teachers, uh, Natela Ladashvili, Gaene Ali Begashvili, Aneli Volskaya, uh, Rusu Dangenia. So they studied monumental and um, uh, metal works of Swaneti. Uh, in their studies are different stylistic composition and uh, iconographic peculiarities of um, murals they studied. Uh, their historical and artistic meaning on the basis of characteristic features of painted decoration of local churches, uh, they single out painting school of Swanetti. And I have to stress particularly uh, studies and research of Marina Enia who, um, who broadened and who introduced new um, brought new level into the study of Swanetti murals, and um, we will hear her <coughs> presentation later. Uh, Gainel Begashvili, in her studies on medieval painted icons, briefly outlines pictorial vocabulary of icons belonging to Swanetti painting school. She gives general stylistic characteristics of this group of icons, like precise chisel she used, and mostly scholars use this term, uh, design inspired by repousse, uh, flat forms, emotional faces, <clears throat> emotional faces with specific exaggerated large eyes, palette based on brown, uh, I'm putting uh, Ali Begashuri's characterization of uh, Swanetti icons, uh, <clears throat> brown and gray hues, and so on. In some icons, she sees, <coughs> quotation, simplified version of modeling of the 11th, 12th century icons. Translation of Paleologon style of the 14th, 15th century to the quotation, graphical and flattened style, end of quotation. General surveys of painted icons attributed to Swanetti could be found in several books of general character. I mean books published in Europe in um, uh, various European languages in 1980s. <clears throat> famous book um, icon, Le Icone, and then translated in various languages, then Tesori de la Georgia, and so on. So in several guidebooks and um, 
catalogs, these materials is also introduced. And I have to mention, of course, uh, my publications and that of Nana Burjuladze. But I have to say that no special uh, research uh, has been conducted so far. I mean these uh, so-called Swanetti icons. <clears throat> And I have to confess that in my studies, I deliberately avoid uh, discussion of these icons between, because for me, uh, Svanetti school, this puzzle, let's say, some um, very important elements are missing and I evo avoided consideration uh, in my presentation, in my studies. Study of the artistic heritage of Swanetti is not an easy task, especially when one deals with mobile artifacts. Although uh, an attitude towards Swanetti as a remote, hardly accessible region, which was a mere depository of religious artifacts from other parts of Georgia, is challenged. Still, I think it is appropriate to offer a brief historical overview of Swanetti illustrating its engagement in the life of medieval Georgian political and cultural life. So Swanetti, like other historical regions <clears throat> or principalities or duchies, Ayristao, played a significant role in socio-political, economic, and cultural life of Georgian kingdom uh, throughout centuries. Swanetti and its inhabitants are described in Roman, Byzantine, Armenian historical sources. And just to spare <coughs> our time, uh, so his, this is the famous um, so description by Strabo of Swans. Uh, inhabitants of Swanetti, and so I skip quotation and you can read yourself. Okay, uh, the borderland mountain region connected northern Caucasus with Caucasus and Iberia as well, had a great um, strategic meaning. Thus, a hegemony uh, in Swanetti was crucial for representatives of power, both Georgian and foreign. Swanetti was a part of Caucasus in ancient times, then until the mid sixth century uh, of its successor, Kingdom of Egris or Lazica. In the, uh, from the late eighth century, um, it um, Made, it made part of Kingdom of Abkhazia. Already in the fifth century, Swanetti was governed by Eristavi Archon, assigned by the king. The historical chronicle, particularly the life of Vachtang Gorgasali, ascribed to Juan Shep, so Vachtang, these are the so years of his reign, appointed his noble go, nobles um, as governors of uh, Swanetti. You see here quotation. Okay. Mm. In the 6th century, during Lazica War, Byzantium and Persia tried to conquer um, Swanetti. After establishing the unified kingdom of Georgia, Swanetti was um, Sairistavo, governed by Eristavs. In the 11th century, um, 11th, 14th century, Swan nobility were uh, quite prominent in the historical arena. Kutaisi, which was the capital of the kingdom uh, until of Georgia, naturally, uh, 1122, when David IV reconquired Tbilisi, uh, facilitated contacts between royal power and Swanetti. Among the Swan nobility were especially prominent members of Vardaniste and Marushiani family, feudal houses. Uh, they are mentioned in several, uh, several times in the royal chronicles, especially in the 13th century uh, text um, known as historian eulogies of monarchs. And um, again, you can read, you can, so I highlight it uh, with both the mentioning of these um, persons and what is especially important, you see in the last quotation, this is the description of the uh, coronation of King uh, Tamar. And um, you see that sword, uh, this was the very <coughs> important part of the ritual of coronation. And um, among the um, nobles who attended and who were privileged to take part in this and to girdle uh, queen, king, Tamar, Vardaniste, Amaneliste, Sahiriste are um, mentioned. During, okay. Um, uh, from the 15th century, after the disintegration of United Kingdom of Georgia, Principality of Swanetti was ruled by princely houses of Gelovani and Dadeshkeliani. Swanetti was divided in separate parts. Uh, you were in Upper Swanetti, and believe me, although in Lower Swanetti there are few um, monuments, but they worth to see next time, <laughs> take into consideration and plan your trip to Lower Swanetti. After uh, Ottoman invasion in West Georgia in early 18th century, isolation from the central parts of Georgia significantly increased, uh, uh, decreased uh, the local social and cultural uh, situation. So unfortunately, we mm, know very little about Swanetti in the early medieval period. No uh, textual, archeological, architectural, or visual evidences uh, reveal more or less uh, relevant material for reconstruction of complete picture, uh, I am not saying about sporadic findings and sporadic publication, I mean the coherent uh, general picture. Um, 
And what we know that um, generally Swanetti Church is updated by the both architecture and earliest painting by 9th, uh, 10th century. Uh, the lack of written sources dealing with creation and veneration of icons in Swanetti are partly compensated by the local visual material. While talking about the importance of icon and their veneration, we must consider icons depicted in monumental painting, uh, both um, in the interior and exterior. I skip uh, discussion of these images, extremely important because I have published them and you can see my paper on Academia Edu. Uh, and today I will offer some observations um, concerning Chem. A small single nave church is covered. Do you recognize this village and church? Okay, a small single nave church is covered with barrel vault to blind arches. Okay, you know the interior and I skip description of the um, interior, right? An absidal program consisting from visionary daisies, traditional composition for apsidal cones of Svaneti, four framed half figures of church father you see uh, through the, the, these openings, arched openings. Um, okay, and an image of the Christ not made by human hand, a Hiropitos uh, above the altar. This is the complete program of the apes. Um, in the daisies, enthroned Christ is flanked by the interceding, so traditional visionary, uh, visionary daisies. And um, you see here the masonry um, chancel barrier uh, with four images of um, archangels. They are inscribed, Michael, uh, Gabriel, Uriel, and Raphael. And this panel, this is a really very important piece of uh, evidence. Uh, the temple on Bean, um, but it's later, not of the 13th century, as the, as the um, painting is dated. And uh, with these is again, and they are treated like separate icons. This is seven, uh, consists from seven figures. Uh, Christ um, uh, supplicating virgins and John, then uh, the, um, they are followed by archangels and they are flanked by St. Peter and Paul. On the vault and walls are depicted six compositions from, oops, uh, from the Dodecaorton. Ah, here you see better image of the, sorry. Yeah, here is it. So there are six um, evangelic compositions and huge, um, huge iconic images on the south and uh, north walls. Uh, you see St. Barbara, St. Catherine, and uh, traditional archangels. And scholars um, find, uh, and um, it's really worth to mention, the inspiration of the, at least the layout, the compositional structure, they find um, parallels with Iprati painting, which is quite, quite close from this church. Murals with... Um, um, and what is important, that today uh, we see the under layer, is it correct? Uh, so it's not the, without finishing. And on the fragments, if you enlarge the um, image of one of the, of one of the angels, you see the final um, design on, uh, on his face, uh, on here. So what we see now, uh, it's um, preparatory, let's say layer, under layer. Uh, so, um, the clumps, somewhat clumsy figures with exaggerated eyes and gestures, they represent um, the other, in their own way, the other worldliness of the celestial realm. Murals with um, yeah, the other reality, a world beyond our physical perception. The individual iconic figures of sense staring with their huge eyes no, without any emotions bring transcendental dimension to the images. These murals represent a specific perception of Christian dogmas, sacred history and mysteries performed in the sacred space, with the, which is based on the local spiritual experience and regional practices, religious practices. The paint decoration of St. Barbara Church, uh, let me go now to my main uh, topic. Uh, reveals an interesting usage of images of various types which contribute to shaping of sacred space. In this respect, it is rather instructive to consider fresco icons. I intentionally don't, um, de determine, don't um, uh, define them as pseudo-icons. They are fresco icons. 
and um, in literature you can find imitation of icons or pseudo icons, but they are fresco icons. The titles of the depicted bishops have been erased so they can be identified by iconographic features with uh, some caution. Unfortunately, I have only two pictures. They are four in framed with um, huge uh, frames. So um, from uh, right to left uh, must be Basil uh, the Great, then Gregory the Theologian, uh, then um, comes uh, Saint John Chrysostomos, and probably Saint Nicholas, you can't see them. These church fathers are often depicted together, since it was um, believed that they provided protection and in intercession in, differ in difficulties and in state affairs. Uh, three of them, St. John, Gregory, and Basil, are commemorated um, on uh, January 30th. Their feast was established in Byzantium in 1084. And while thinking about um, actual icons, uh, which could be models for the icons, I found out that uh, besides, um, apart from, uh, with the exception of St. Nicholas, church fathers, especially in the early period and um, early Georgian medieval time, or early Byzantine and the middle Byzantine period, the individual icons of church fathers are dramatically lacking. Only, the only one is Yenashi, if I'm not mistaken, Saint Basil, but uh, so painting is not preserved and only Repuse is, um, survived, has survived. And uh, usually they serve a church father's supplementary role. Uh, so this is what I found quickly in the internet, and, you know, these well-known uh, wings of triptych with St. Nicholas and St. John Chrysostom, and this later icon, 14th century, from Hermitage with church fathers and three hierarchs from um, Byzantine Museum of Athens. Um, the inframed monumental figures of the hierarchs with compa compact silhouettes and rep uh, are represented against monochrome gray background. Uh, so interchangeable with interchangeable gray, background gray and red. And this is the subtle play of, um, so coloristic play, let's say. Uh, two icons have frames with simple two color geometric pattern like um, this one, uh, like Gregory has. Uh, and uh, two have this plain yellow um, frames. Uh, exaggerated uh, exaggerated um, eyes and uh, enlarged uh, uh, blessing right hand uh, and huge gospel. Again, now we have absolutely different picture. Tanya Vermes, who published this, um, pay, this uh, murals, she uh, indicates that uh, strangely, curiously, the crosses are um, missing from Felonium and uh, gospels are undecorated. If you look closer, there are remnant traces of uh, original decoration. But so the upper part, um, layer of painting is missing right now. And you see the uh, polystavron, the uh, traditional garment is um, decorated with checkered uh, ornament here. Okay, depiction of the fresco icons of the church fathers in the sanctuary apes is encounter encountered in number of 11th, 13th century. Yeah, this is the view I combined two uh, photos. Uh, so uh, this is well-known practice, and um, in Ohrid, in Hagia Sophia, in Zicha, in Bachkovo, of course, you can find this tradition. It has been suggested that this type of picture, um, portraits have, um, have its um, origins in the early Christian practice of exhibiting portraits of bishop in church apses. The mentioned tradition is stemmed from the early Christian custom of, create, of creation of images of the local bishops for veneration. We have important written evidences of this tradition. After the death of fourth century bishop of Antioch, St. Meletius, uh, Christians uh, set up his portraits uh, in their homes, and so, uh, St. John Chrysostom um, so delivered the homilies, uh, prizing him, and here this uh, quotation from his homily. Again, to spare your time, I just, um, I, I highlighted some places. Uh, so he stresses it was a custom to name children, uh, Meletius, as, um, as a sign, as a uh, demonstration of the reverence and piety. And he uh, underlines how important it is to um, depict uh, the venerable holy man, and, um, yeah, but also saw the depiction of his body over the place and had a double consolation for his loss, and this is important, I think. Uh, this is well-known text. Mm -hmm. uh, the introduction of uh, fresco icons in church uh, 
Fresco icons of the Church Fathers in Epsidal programs may have many reasons. Sharon Gerstel, who dedicated huge and um, fantastic research on this topic um, uh, on Epsidal programs, um, the frontal hieras with the closed gospel books in the lower Epsidal register are typical for early Christian periods. She connects such images with um, with aspasmos, or veneration of gospels. After iconoclast, representations of the bishops were um, included into the church, pro church programs, and let me remind you the famous Hagia Sophia, Hagia Sophia upper register um, uh, church fathers. So they assign um, a manifestation of orthodoxy uh, permanently found their place into the church decoration. It is generally accepted that epsidal paintings mirror um, mirror uh, ongoing ceremony and the depicted bishops are perceived as um, concelebrants of the liturgy. Quoting Jeffrey Anderson, the artist treated icons as a conceptualized object that could be manipulated to specify locale. The decoration of St. Barbara Church provides intriguing interplay of various types of images attendance of liturgies and um, prayer just um, prayer for during a personal prayer, personal piety, acts of personal piety. They face the sanctuary, okay, with, um, let me go back, yeah. Just a minute, let me find the proper picture. Uh, where is it? Okay, let it be this one. Uh, so they face the, um, on the, East part of the south and north wall, they see uh, holy women. Then um, on the west part, uh, huge archangels. Archangels are again on the chancel barrier, uh, and he dominates the com composition of daisies, which is repeated in this um, templon beam. And uh, finally, uh, through these uh, openings, <coughs> they view, they see these um, fresco icons. Unfortunately, it is hard to speak about visibility of the uh, of fresco icons, but presumably they were revealing to the faithful in certain moments during the celebrations. The iconic monumental programs of the holy women and mm, we don't know original uh, decoration and structure of the um, chain of decoration, whether it was um, covered with curtains of icons, so it, is, um, it would be speculation to judge about the visibility of these uh, images. So uh, the iconic monumental figures of the holy women and archangels um, uh, formally and conceptually are linked with the named images, I mean the east, uh, in the east part. The images of various size placed in the apes sanctuary barrier and name walls create many levels of visual hierarchy. The size and topography of fresco icons quite explicitly demonstrate the exceptional meaning of depicted icons of the bishops. The wide frames visually and conceptually uh, separate these images from the epsidal composition of the daisies and ahiropoitos, uh, ahiropitos. In other words, the frame demarcate two realms, the uh, celestial and earthly ones, that on its turn bring closer the images of the church fathers to the people gathered in the church. It is significant that the images of the holy bishops have frames which imitate actual icon frames, and you can see this type of frame uh, right directly um, in the church. I mean this huge icon of enthroned uh, Christ, and what is amazing that the reverse of the icon is uh, again um, decorated with this ornament, simple geometric ornament, which uh, you find e everywhere in the murals. Uh, and um, unfortunately, so I, I have black and white pictures, um, so they have been uh, taken many, many years ago, and uh, they have, some of the icons have the same uh, ornament. So the size and topography of icons, um, Sorry. Okay. The frame imitating actual painted icons produced in the region transformed the bishop's portraits into specific devotional images. Although the emphasis of the images of the bishops could be explained by various reasons, I would suggest that the iconic guis of the uh, prelates imagery was chosen to stress the importance of clergy. 
it is also, and this is not the final um, research. I just started thinking about this, and I had to dig uh, deeper into the history of uh, um, church at this period, and particularly what was going on in Swanetti. This is my future um, project, let's say. Uh, okay, also the emphasis of the images of the bishops could be, okay. Uh, it is also, it also could be assumed that uh, the commissioners of the painted decoration were clerics. These types of images underline importance of prayer and contemplations. They also may have commemorative and devotional as well as apotropaic function. Uh, the considered fresco icons accumulate diverse types of cultural paradigms and visual traditions. It seems to me for the future discussion it would be rather, and not only of these frescoes generally, uh, I mean um, appreciation again, evaluation, re-evaluation of Sonetti painting, it would be rather appropriate to apply to polysystem translation theory developed in 1970s by I will finish here in a couple of minutes, by uh, Itamar Ivan Zohar and Gideon Thury. Uh, this trend was an important turn in terms of interpretation uh, of original and translated uh, literature. The shift was made from equivalency to functionalism, focusing on the receptor. According to Ivan Zohar, translated literature, okay, here is the quotation. Mm. Oh, where I am. Okay, translation, <laughs> literature uh, is a system on its right, existing in varying relationships with original compositions. Both occupy positions in literary system, whether central or peripheral, and both perform literary functions, whether innovative or conservatory. We will, if we accept this um, interpretation and this, uh, we follow this path, uh, we, I, I, and I'm finishing. Uh, I would like to quote uh, the views expressed by Turi, who demonstrate how functionality substituted adequ uh, adequacy. Uh, in other words, the whole story is about receptibility of the model and ways of expression by receiving culture. It has been demonstrated that a role assumed by images in a new cultural context could differ from the original model or archetype. I argue that specific pictorial language of Swanetti painting, and particularly of the murals under discussion, is a clear illustration of the above-mentioned theories. Thank you. Thank you.